Okay, welcome to the webinar today on Introduction to Digitization. Um, grateful thanks to the Regional Heritage Stewardship Program that is hosting it. Um, we will be presenting in two parts today. So I will go ahead and get started on the first part. My name is Gina Strack, and I am the Digital Archives Manager for the Utah Division of Archives and Record Service, also known as the Utah State Archives. Mahal and I have split up our presentation today between in-house digitization and outsourcing. I will be covering some best practices and recommendations for digitizing it yourself. I will also talk more I will talk more in general terms to allow for variations in institution size, funding, the variety of software so solutions available, plus of course formats of both original materials and digital files. We will leave some time for questions at the end of each presentation. Uh, go ahead and send those questions to the chat or the Q&A. The Utah Division of Archives and Record Service helps state and local agencies in Utah manage their records and fulfill public access laws. We preserve historic records for permanent, for permanent public access. The records that we digitize and publish online are one way to provide that public access anytime, anywhere, and for free. I began working with digitization in late 2005 as a processing and reference archivist. By 2013, we had over a million pages online. It has been a journey. I will be sharing what has helped me in my position in a small but innovative organization. So you wanna start digitizing your materials, perhaps for online access. Here's a few things to consider before you start. Thinking long-term, do you want to digitize for just one project, possibly funded by a grant, or do you want to leverage today's investment into a future program that becomes a part of your normal operations? Answers will likely vary on what is ideal and what is realistic. However, it's valuable to think more strategically since we often don't have all the resources that we'd like to have. Here at the State Archives, I have actually just scheduled uh, a kind of strategic planning meeting that we call the Digital Archive Summit uh, in, for a few weeks from now. And that will help us plan out the next fiscal year and set our priorities and also get feedback from the various stakeholders, both internally and externally. And we have been able to move digitization from paper and microfilm into several interconnected programs over the years. But at this point, uh, audiovisual materials still need to be outsourced generally. Whether or not you will be pursuing a one-time project or one within a fully staffed program, you need to start with planning. I will be using a lot today material from a Digitization Project's Best Practice Guide from the Council of State Archivists. You can download a copy from statearchivists.org under their State Electronic Records Initiative page. They explain that a project plan establishes the vision and goals for the project, summarizes key points of context, identifies stakeholders, addresses risks for the long-term preservation of and access to digitized materials, and communicates the overall plan for the project. Planning is hard work, but I promise that any of that work done up front will save so much time and hassle later on. It's also a bigger subject than we can possibly cover in depth today, so I encourage you to find help and resources on such topics as setting priorities, material selection, accessibility, and adhering to your institution's mandates or mission. There will always be someone you can meet and get to know who is further along their journey, or they have just that bit of knowledge you need to move forward. I'm personally grateful for all of those who helped me get started. 
I benefited from a regional organization formed around the Mountain West Digital Library. Its digitization committee has supported many in getting started and learning from each other. Is someone changing their software platform? Well, someone else has already been through it and will gladly share some lessons learned. Digitization is still relatively new and the technology changes rapidly. So hands-on experience can be the best teacher. In addition, many professional associations will provide the infrastructure to connect with others doing similar work. There may be interest groups or roundtables that then sponsor conference sessions dedicated to the subject. Journals may provide case studies, but even casual sources like blogs or social media can be great resources or ways to find new friends. And if you don't have a lot of resources for professional development, I can recommend something like the Digital Library Federation, which will allow you to join their working groups uh, without being a member uh, of one of their institutional members. Let's get into the nuts and bolts. Everyone's situation will be slightly different, but I'll try to provide some overview to the resources you'll need to do digitization yourself. You've done the extensive planning, and now it's time to purchase a piece of equipment. You'll want to make sure that you have all of the accessories you need for the target project, such as a transparency lid for a flatbed scanner in order to digitize negatives. Don't make assumptions about capabilities, ask for specifics, especially from vendors that want to sell you things. If you're new to digitization, take it slow, establishing a good workflow. You'll probably change it several times as you learn. Whether there's one person on the project or many, document procedural steps to reference and train on. I like quick Google Docs, but you can also record your screen to make a video for later reference. Recently, I came to better understand the difference between quality control and quality assurance. Quality assurance will be the effective workflow you develop and that you'll continue to refine as you go. Quality control is evaluating what is delivered to check whether specifications have been met. This is vital for an outsourced vendor, but even internally, you'll want to check results from any handoff or before switching tasks. If you're on your own doing all of the work, it's still easy to imagine having to put aside a project and then later trying to figure out why you didn't make sure the resolution was the same as when you started. One of the most difficult limitations, whether in a project or program, will be infrastructure, most especially storage. There's this thinking that digital storage is cheap because it's not physical except that there's still the physical presence and costs associated with servers, data centers, and bandwidth to move around content. First, you'll need the appropriate space to store digital files upon digitization. This can be limited by the capabilities of equipment in that some will not work with network or cloud storage. So you may have to save initially one way and then move or deliver internally to another location for post-processing. Post-processing includes any work done in between digitization and upload or publication of the final product. It can include cropping, color correction, conversion to the, another file format, such as TIFF to JPEG, and arrangement to prepare to ingest into whatever system or software will enable publication. Finally, you'll need a plan for long-term preservation. A little more about that later. As we've all found out recently with increased remote work, a lot of success rests on the strength of the network. Can you access digital files from multiple locations or are you relying on a single hard drive? Which please don't do that if, if at all possible. Is on-site presence required to access networked resources? Can you share with other staff and volunteers? Do you need to plan ahead to move files from one location to another overnight without overwhelming the connections. In general, you may never have the ideal amount of storage and infrastructure. Ensure that you include any limitations in a project plan so that your projected timeline remains as accurate as possible. 
Unlike these cute meerkats here, people already have a lot going on when they join or are assigned to a project. It's vital to acknowledge in project planning that priorities shift, people go on vacation or have a surgery, and skills don't always apply as expected. There's a magic, feel <clears throat> There's a magic feeling in the near future that looks bright, unscheduled, and full of promise. It's best to be realistic though and include plenty of padding to timelines. Now that we all seem to have tiny computers with cameras in our pockets, we might think that creating digital files is easy. However, when it comes to scaling up to a larger volume and using more sophisticated equipment, real skills and experience are incredibly valuable. Skills can be learned with training opportunities. Experience often comes the hard way, but both can be gained and built up even if you're starting from scratch. This is where a good network comes in, whether with personal connections or scouring online forums for advice. One risk of in-house projects is what if someone moves on? Can their experience be replaced with other staff or will a replacement or new hire have to be trained from the beginning? It's worth considering this as part of general succession planning and possibly including in project plans as a risk assessment. You can mitigate the risk by documenting roles and responsibilities so that replacing a project member for whatever reason will not completely derail the project. So now for sustainability and a little long-term planning. There is a bit of a joke that the only way to truly keep information forever is to carve it into stone. It's true that digital preservation is a complex subject but it must be considered with digitization as a matter of sustainability. In the relatively short history of digitization, more than a few collections have been lost due to technology changes or lack of long-term planning. And that includes grant-funded projects where the grant funders are not very happy when their money does not go very far. Even if you don't have a full preservation system, there are interim solutions or potential partnerships and services that can step in for preservation. As an example, the Utah State Archives does not actually have a preservation system yet. We're working on it. And so in the interim, we use a technology called MDIS. Their full name is Milleniata DIS. And yes, they're optical DIS, but they're made out of a very sturdy material that is supposed to last well, for a millennia, that's as long as you have the disk drives, of course. But it has allowed us to save these millions of images, literally, in a fairly safe and stable location uh, in preparation for long-term preservation. And we use the Library of Congress bagger packaging technology to get checksums and make sure that we can compare before and after transfer. So to put it simply, when you're talking about sustainability uh, of the data sets, the metadata, and the documentation of the project, you want to ensure that the final product continues to be useful well into the future. So however you digitize, I wish you well on your digitization journey. Are there any questions about digitizing yourself in-house? Okay, I don't see anything in the chat right now. I hope I'm not missing your question. Oh. There's a question right there. What types of cameras and scanners do you use? At the Utah State Archives, we have mostly been digitizing from microfilm because we have a large microfilm collection. And so that was one of the first technologies that we obtained. We have a couple of flatbed scanners that we've used periodically and not really in high volume. Um, about two years ago, we um, acquired an overhead digital camera and we were able to actually 
um, redeploy some of our microfilm specialists who are trained in photography to go ahead and do digital photography. So that's been great. And um, we are starting to publish some of the first collections from the digital camera. Okay, next question. Is there a study or a resource that includes information on pay scale for someone who would be working full-time digitization? I know each state or region is different. That's a really interesting question. I'm not quite aware of something off the top of my head, but of course, um, it would depend on the state or region. And um, in the, the, what I know of the most in the state archives, we don't have anyone working full time on digitization. Even I still process collections arc, um, as an archivist. And so I don't know how to make that comparable. I think the DLF has some resources on that though. So I would look them up. I'd like to know the name of the manual you mentioned at the top that's available through COSA or the Council of State Archivists. Um, if you go to statearchivist.org and then um, go to their Siri or State Electronic Records Initiative, it is, should be on that first page with other Siri resources. So it's called Digitization Best Practices. Okay. Next question, would the purchase of a server just for archive use be a good option for long-term storage? Um, I think that's a pretty good option. The only problem is you're not gonna have the full preservation measures such as um, like fidelity with checksums and migration to new file formats in the future. Like I said, digital preservation is really complicated. However, if the server does have a backup and it is well managed, then it's probably as good as our MDIS. Okay, how do you preserve data stored on external hard drives? If all you have is external hard drives, then at least make sure that you have multiple copies because um, I have definitely lost data on external hard drives. They are fragile, especially if you accidentally knock them around. And so what you want to do is get them off the external hard drives as soon as possible to a more long term solution. Because and at the very most, I would only use an external hard drive for five years of, at the most. Let's see. Do you have a sample workflow documentation and metadata capture to share? Um, I don't have that online right now. However, I will be sharing some workflow documents to the library workflow exchange site. Um, I don't know the exact link to that, but it's a wonderful site that has been started for people to exchange workflow and documentation with each other. So I would look that up. Okay. All right, we have been digitizing a photo collection since 2005. Our database includes scanned archival photos and born digital photos. We have a default requirement for TIFFs. Is that common? Uh, TIFFs are great for digitized materials. I think born digital photos, a lot of them are not going to come off of a camera as TIFFs. So you would have to evaluate what is the best and most original format for those photographs. Um, we have not done that at the State Archives yet, except for I think we have some governor's photographs. And they just came off of a basic digital camera, so they are JPEG. So at this point, we're just probably going to preserve the JPEG files. Okay. Are there any resources for museums who are digitizing object files? Um, I'm afraid I don't know what object files are. Um, I do work with digital objects, which are kind of like a package of files. Um, but if you're thinking more like three dimensional, I don't really work in museums, so I don't have any resources at hand, but that's a really good thing to look for. Okay. How do you decide whether to digitize in house at possibly lower quality rather than outsource at a higher quality? Um, I probably would try to not accept the lower quality because you don't actually have to do that. If your limitation is storage space, 
then just evaluate what your capacity is. I don't know if I would, because I don't like the idea of going lower quality just because of other limitations. Um, so maybe get with your funders and stakeholders to have that discussion. Can you repeat the name of the library website? Um, I believe it's called Library Workflow Exchange. And um, I might try and look up that link and put it in the chat later. Okay. Um, if that's about it for all the questions, then I can hand it off for Mahala to start on her part about outsourcing and presenting a case study. Thank you, Gina. Um, so I'm going to shift gears a little and talk about another option for digitizing records from your collection, which is outsourcing. So I want to give you a super brief background about me. I have my degrees in history and got my start in this field working as a student in grad school at the University of New Hampshire Special Collections and Archives. In addition to my work there, I worked for four years at a small museum, which will actually come up again in a bit. And at the State Archives, I have a dual role. I am an archivist who works primarily with local government records, and I also serve as Executive Secretary for the Utah State Historical Records Advisory Board, in which role I handle most of the administrative aspects of the board, including facilitating our regional training program and managing our regrant program, which is funded by the National Historical Publications and Records Commission, or NHPRC, at the National Archives. So I first want to address some of the pros and cons of outsourcing digitization work. First and foremost, as we heard from Gina, successfully managing a digitization project or program can be a lot of work and use a lot of your institutional and staff resources. You might be a small museum or historical society that lacks equipment um, and the resources to manage a digital preservation system, or you might be all volunteer run or operate with a small staff that just doesn't have the time or expertise to properly manage a digitization project. As we've learned, Digitizing your collection is going to be a lot more than simply scanning a few photos or documents, and that's okay. Outsourcing or planning with an outside, partnering with an outside source ensures that your project will be managed with the relevant professional expertise. It ensures that the end product will be produced according to best practices and standards, and the staff who work at the institution, institution that you're outsourcing your work to will be trained and will have the time that you just don't have to complete your project and ensure long-term preservation. I do want to acknowledge, however, that outsourcing can be expensive, especially upfront, and that it comes with a loss of control over the project or collection. You'll be physically transferring your collection to another institution, so you'll need to be prepared for and account for that in your plans. On that note, there are some important considerations that you'll want to keep in mind. One is contracts. You should negotiate and sign a contract with your outside source that addresses standards, including image resolution, file formats, and more. Another huge topic is metadata. You must have the appropriate metadata for your collection. Before coming up with any project proposal, make sure that you have intellectual control over your collection i.e. that you know what's in it and where and what state it's in physically, and that you've assessed its value. You need to have answered for yourself the question of why should this be digitized? Why is it important to my institution's mission that it be in this new format? Also consider the physical state of the collection and whether or not your contract addresses the special needs of your collection. For example, your vendor is going to need to care for nitrate negatives in a very different way than it cares for magnetic media. And lastly, don't forget to discuss the timeline of your project. This is especially important if you're working with grant funds that might come with deadlines. A second consideration is the worksite. 
Where is the institution or company that you're contracting to do the work located? And how will you be getting your collection to them? Can you transport it yourself or will you need to ship it? What kinds of transportation or shipping procedures will you need to follow? Thirdly, consider cost. While contracting services may be more expensive upfront, the long-term benefits are likely going to be worth it. Remember too, that in some cases you'll be paying for both the work and the long-term storage in a digital preservation system. If projects seem cost prohibitive, there are often grants or other funding opportunities that can help. You can contact your local or state art, arts agencies, nonprofits that support the work of humanities, or historical records advisory boards, or look to the federal level for help. I'm going to now present to you all a case study of a very successful project that outsourced digitization work. I'll walk you through it start to finish, but first I want to explain why I'm choosing this project in particular. Not only is this project a good example of a successful partnership, I have some extra perspective on it because I happened to work at the Park City Museum as they put together the proposal, secured grant funding to see it through, and in the early stages of the work itself. I then got a new position and changed jobs to my current work at the State Archives. Here at the Archives, I am Executive Secretary for the Utah State Historical Records Advisory Board, or USHRAB, the body that provided the grant funding to the museum that contributed to this project. So I saw it through from start to finish, first as an employee of the museum and then as administrator of the grant program involved in assisting with the work. So to give you a brief background on the museum so that you understand the context of this project. The museum is located in Park City, Utah, a town of about 8,000 people around 30 miles east of Salt Lake City. Most people know it as a prime tourist destination for skiing and winter sports, as well as biking and hiking in the summer. The museum is right on Main Street and operates with a staff of four. They have around 12,000 square feet of exhibit space and their permanent collection contains objects from its mining past and early skiing history, including textiles, images, manuscript collections, a non-circulating research library, and more. In 2018, the museum decided to put together a proposal for a digitization project and seek grant funding from the USHRAB to do this work. As Gina and I briefly addressed, there are plenty of steps to consider when putting together a digitization project. One of the first is selecting your project. First and foremost, the selection needs to fit within your institution's mission and advance your goals. The museum's mission is to protect, preserve, and promote Park City history. They needed to choose a collection with strong historical research and intrinsic value. They settled on the Kendall Webb collection of images from Park City throughout the 1940s to the 1970s. Webb was a professional photographer who moved to Park City in the 1940s. He set up shop and proceeded to document the town's history for the next 30 years. He took tens of thousands of photos of high school sports and social activities, portraits of families and weddings, scout groups, and all sorts of daily life in Park City. For anyone unfamiliar with Park City history, the 40s through the 70s was a unique time. Park City was first founded as a mining town in the 1880s that saw explosive growth through the turn of the century. By the 1940s, however, a variety of factors had made mining unprofitable and the town's economy and population had shrunk dramatically. The 60s and 70s saw new growth from the burgeoning winter sports scene. So the decades documented by Webb show a town in a time of profound change. The museum chose this collection because it is, a, it is unique of high historical research and intrinsic value, fit its mission, and importantly, it was in danger of being lost. When considering collections for potential digitization projects, always think about the physical condition. Collections that are subject to rapid deterioration or media obsolescence are prime candidates for digitization. Webb, like other photographers in his era, worked with acetate negatives particularly in the early years. When designing the, this digitization project, the museum decided to prioritize the oldest negatives in this collection, those from the first decade or so of Webb's Park City career. 
This amounted to around 3,000 negatives. Acetate negatives, as many of you probably know, are extremely prone to deterioration. On this slide is an example of what this deterioration looks like. While there are very limited conservation options for dealing with this, they are expensive and difficult. Since the deterioration is inevitable and ongoing, the museum had limited time with which to capture the information in the Kendall Webb collection before it was too late. However, the museum lacked the resources to quickly, safely, and efficiently digitize this collection in-house. With limited equipment and only four staff members, there was simply no time, space, or expertise to dedicate to this project. Instead, the museum sought the services of the University of Utah's Marriott Library. The Marriott Library is a part of a consortium known as the Mountain West Digital Library and serves as a digitization hub. They have a robust program that works not only on, the digitiz on digitizing the university's special collections and archives, but also provides contract services for institutions throughout the region. The university is therefore set up well for projects exactly like the digitization of the Kendall Webb Collection, including having the expertise for handling and caring for acetate negatives throughout the process. The university is located in Salt Lake City, so the museum was able to transport their collection themselves. Additionally, the, the library has a digital preservation system capable of hosting the digitized master files from the Kendall Webb Collection. This was an important consideration for the museum when they made the decision to outsource the digitization work because the museum lacks the server space or cloud storage capabilities to provide for long-term care of these master files. You need to remember that di digitization is not just the process of scanning and putting online photos and other media. You're essentially creating an entirely new collection that requires its own level of care in addition to the original physical collection. Museum staff cre created and provided metadata to the university. While some institutions, including the Marriott Library, have different payment tiers for inputting metadata for collections that they're digitizing, the cheapest and easiest option is usually when you provide your vendor with metadata that they can import. Exactly what metadata you provide and in what format may depend on your individual situation and the requirements of the entity you're contracting with. But metadata is a must. The collection you're digitizing should be processed to a point where you know what you have, why it's important, and where it is. Your collection should be properly housed and described before you digitize it. This slide presents an example of the metadata you'd need to provide when organizing a digitization project. There could be a whole separate webinar just on this topic, so I don't wanna to get too far into the weeds here, but this is information you would likely have once you've processed your collection. When digitizing, you'll need to provide it to your vendor so that they can attach it to the collection. In this slide, we see the image on the left of a May Day or Queen of May celebration in Park City. On the right, is the associated metadata, including a title, description, and date. The creator is Kendall Webb, and there is an associated rights statement. If you were to click on the link that says open resource in a new window, you'd see even more associated data, like the size of the original negative and the date the digitized copy was created by staff at the Marriott Library. I also wanna call attention to the cost aspects of this project. The museum needed to pay for this work and the university charged a project setup fee, labor per photograph, and time for metadata input, as well as ingestion into the digital preservation system. The project was going to come with a price tag and the museum needed outside support to cover it. They crafted a proposal from, for grant funding from the Utah State Historical Records Advisory Board and were awarded funds for this project. Every state has a board like this, though some are more active than others, and many run grant programs. If cost is a barrier to your institution, I encourage you to look up your state's SHRAB and see what resources they offer. The museum's project took about a year and cost around $14,000, about half of which was reimbursed by a USHRAB grant. After digitization was complete and the collection transferred back to the museum, Staff prepared the collection for cold storage, which has been shown to slow the deterioration process. 
Cold storage complicates physical access due to the fact that objects need a rest period when removed from storage before they can be handled. But the museum can now access the images and all of the associated metadata now that the digitization is complete. Access to the images is also freely available to the public on the Mountain West Digital Library website. Nearly 3,000 images are up and searchable as seen here. On this slide, I've listed a couple of resources for you all, including the URLs for the NHPRC and the Mountain West Digital Library. You can also find a list of SHRABs and more information on the Council of State Archivists website also listed here. And finally, this topic is one that could be and is addressed in countless webinars. There is so much more to talk about that Gina and I have barely touched on. The URL here for the Association for Library Collections and Technical Services will take you to tons of resources for digitization projects. You can also check out the Society of American Archivists, the American Alliance of Museums, and the American Association for State and Local History. This is Gina's and my contact information for you, again, if you want to reach out to us as well. Now we've got some time for some more questions, um, if you'd like to use that chat box feature. Gina and I, um, if you have any questions for Gina as well, I can, I can try to answer some of those. We have a question here that says, did the museum import into past perfect? Um, the answer to that is yes. Um, the museum did create a finding aid. Um, they also created a catalog record in past perfect where they attached um, most of that information um, into a catalog record. We have a much more digital, detailed metadata for our photos. Um, what escalation in price could that entail? That would probably depend on um, the vendor that you're using. For the Marriott Library, um, if you go to their website, the, they, have, um, they have their prices broken down into tiers based on um, who is creating the metadata rather than how much metadata there is. So, if you're providing the metadata for them, it's going to be cheaper than if they were to create it themselves. So we have a question that says, what is the website for the museum's online library? Um, so you can go to the Mountain West Digital Libraries website, that's mwdl.org, um, and you can search for all the various collections hosted on that website, including the Park City Museums. And if you go to that, um, you'll see all of their digitized collections there. There's a question here that asks, is there a sample summary or even detailed workflow of, the pro of their project available as a model to follow? That's a really good question. Um, they, as a, as a wrap up to their grant project, um, they had to submit a final report to us at the USHRAB. Um, so we do have a final report. We are actually in the process of sort of updating our USHRAB website to feature things like um, example applications that were successful, um, example reports, that kind of thing. Because this was such a successful project, I'll probably um, include it there. Um, I don't really have a timeline for when that information will be up. Um, but maybe if you want to reach out to me, I can chat with you a little bit more about that. We have a question here that, um, that Gina, maybe you can talk to a little bit as well. It says, um, I'm interested in hearing about the QC slash QA standards that are appropriate benchmarks both on vendor and in-house side of an outsourced project. 
For instance, what percentage of returned files should be checked for resolution slash embedded metadata? Um, sure thing. Um, at least for in-house at the state archives, we don't really have like a set amount. At times I have tried to write in like our policy documents, something about like 1% um, spot check. And then if you run into a certain amount of problems, then you send it back to the operators who are digitizing microfilm or now using a digital camera. But we've never really formalized the process, mostly because they're, they're just one, I can just pop downstairs and I can just talk to people. And so that's usually what would happen. Um, I would probably um, have a slightly different relationship with a, a vendor that I might expect to, you know, do this professionally all of the time. Obviously, our staff are professionals as well, but we all kind of work with each other too, so it's a little bit more informal. And I think that that might be something too, if you're outsourcing the work that you can um, discuss with your vendor before you sign a contract. And maybe that information could also be um, put into a contract about what percentage are getting checked, who's doing the checking, that kind of thing. Yeah, that's an excellent idea. Basically, just don't assume anything <laughs> and um, get it in writing in an agreement if it's really important to you. Like, exactly what the embedded metadata is, for instance. There's a question here that asks if you guys will all have um, access to our presentations after this webinar. And um, I believe that this webinar will be um, uh, posted on the CCAHA um, YouTube page. That could probably be confirmed by someone who's not me. Um, but um, I, I do believe that the webinar will be shared. There's a question here that asks backstage library works now Backstage Library Works now offer on-site digitization. Have you used that? What extra cost does this add? Um, I personally am not familiar with this, but um, Gina, I don't know if you have anything to say about this question too. Um, we have not used Backstage Library Works. I mean, I know some repositories in the area have. Um, however, when it comes to on-site digitization, I mean, it'll depend on if it's more of a vendor or a partnership relationship, but a lot of times that can actually reduce your costs. So for instance, one of our longtime partners that a lot of people might be familiar with is Family Surge, where they bring in a camera and volunteers to run the camera, and then they digitize records from our collection on site so they never leave the building. And then th in exchange for their access to the collection, they give us a copy, um, it, high resolution TIFF uh, of the records that they've digitized and, and most of the time also publish on their website. So that's, that's because a lot of our collection is very much wanted by genealogists as a user group. So that's probably why we have that kind of partnership. And it's been very fruitful they have worked on site off and on since like 2004 with us. So here's a question that says, it is not feasible for us to bring our collection to an outsourced company since we have 25,000 plus objects. Do consultants ever come into the museum to work with staff and guide them through the process? We are only a staff of seven with one staff in collections. So um, Gina, a little bit of what you were just talking about might apply to the, um, as an answer to this question. But the other thing that I will say to you about that is um, maybe with uh, such a big collection, um, think about your digitization pro um, process as more uh, smaller projects. So rather than setting out to digitize your entire 25,000 plus collection, 
um, do you have particular uh, collections within that larger collection that are um, more at risk or um, very frequently accessed and might you know, be prone to damage if they're continued um, to be accessed or um, that just are so, so unique to your institution or to your region um, and maybe focus on those. Um, the case study that I presented from Park City, uh, that actually, the Kendall Web Collection is, is tens of thousands of images. Um, and the museum for the project that I mentioned today only chose 3,000 of those images because they wanted to focus on those most at-risk negatives first. Um, and then, you know, with each year, they put together um, new proposals um, for like the next portion of this collection and then the next and then the next, that kind of thing. So um, that's something to consider as well as you sort of think about what digitization is going to mean for your institution. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I would agree with everything that Mahala just said. And also, um, I, you know, I work in an archives. I don't really know what it's like for museums but I'm not really familiar with consultants. They're, they probably do exist uh, coming in to help do in-house digitization. Um, that's why I talked so much about uh, the network because I mean, so I was basically a fairly new archivist at the time and I was just kind of thrown into it uh, almost like a deep end <laughs> and start swimming. And I basically just kept asking around to other people for help, um, just other librarians and archivists who worked in the region, especially that were associated with the Mountain West Digital Library. And so that's where your, your network really comes in and people can be, they're usually very helpful. Um, there is a place though for professional and paid for consultants and I know I would love to have that for some of our audiovisual materials because we're trying to figure out how to do that. Um, we have a large collection of autograph discs, which are like mid 20th century, kind of like dictaphone kind of materials that was used by the legislature. And we are once again, exploring grant funding op um, options. Um, but one of the thing that's hard is we have tens of thousands of the discs. And so outsourcing would be, I mean, I added it up once because outsourcing for audio is based on playing time. And yeah, we don't have half a million dollars to do that. So um, we're thinking about how can we start smaller um, earlier? So maybe they're more at risk because they're older. Um, maybe we can find more significant uh, parts of the collection. So yeah, th these are all considerations when you are trying to strike that balance between um, the full professional services of outsourcing and partnership, including for preservation, or whether you're going to have to just build up the expertise in-house to take care of maybe a unique format or a unique collection for your institution. We have an interesting uh, attendee contribution to that question as well. Um, someone is saying that they know that the Rakow uh, Research Library at the Corning Museum of Glass has outside vendors come to their library to digitize materials. So um, I personally don't know much about that. So um, that would be something for if anyone wants to look that up um, and possibly like Gina was saying, kind of use those networks to reach out um, and ask them about how that process goes for them. Yeah. Um, private public partnerships can be very valuable. I know the National Archives as part of their strategic planning for digitization because um, they know even as a fairly large institution with a pretty large staff compared to most archives, there's no way that they can digitize their collection on their own. And so they have partnered with more commercial entities, including, you know, ancestry.com and other 
related sites and they've worked out partnerships and agreements such that there's these off-site locations that are still close to where the collections are stored and contracted vendors as part of the partnership come to that off-site location which has security and it has archivists overseeing the work and they bring in the materials, they digitize them, and then they take them back into the collection. So there's, there's lots of different ways you can do it. And I think different services could be offered if you are looking at vendor services. Well, we can probably wait for another minute or so if there are any more questions that um, come in about um, either doing digitization work in-house or outsourcing it. Um, up on the screen should be Gina's and my contact information as well if you want to reach out um, to either of us afterwards. Um, I don't have a ton more to add, um, but Gina, if you have anything else you want to say. Um, no, not really. I, I really enjoyed, well, like the other half of the presentation there. <laughs> um, in fact, I probably could have come up with some more case studies too. Like I said, it has been a journey. Um, I've learned a lot over the years and it's just, it's an ongoing process that will never really come to an end, I guess, until you stop doing that work or retire, I guess. <laughs> We do have a question here that's asking, have you had to advocate or fight for a digitization project and how have you gone about doing so? Um, I'd say that any digitization project um, that you can put together a good argument for that sort of fits within your institution's mission, um, that kind of speaks to um, important history of your region um, uh, you know, I feel like, I don't know, I hope this isn't controversial to say, but I feel like any kind of grant application is sort of an advocation or, or fight for, um, digitization of a project, um, whether or not it gets funded. Um, and so I think that the best way to go about advocating for a project is to just make sure that you can, um, really hone in on why it's important that that collection needs to be digitized. Um, what about, what about it, um, you know, makes it important to be accessible digitally online to the public, et cetera, um, more so than just like say in your research library. Um, so it's really important to consider some of those questions that I brought up in my part of the presentation. Um, about, you know, why is this important? Um, how does it fit into your, um, into your institution's uh, mission statement, into your regional history, uh, et cetera? Yeah, I would just add that if you're uh, fighting for it because it's a matter of budget or funding, um, you might have to just come at it from a different angle and try to figure out alternative ways of presenting it. Um, Cause I'm actually, the one that comes to mind are actually these autograph discs from the legislature. Because I, I feel like it's almost, it's almost just been hanging around as a little bit of curse on my time, just because I first started learning about them quite a few years ago. And we did a very small grant back in 2007 and the point of that grant was essentially for a pilot project to figure out if we could use the equipment we already had and um, just some real basic audio digitization software and set up on just regular computers. And if we could, um, you know, scale that up for the entire collection. 
Well, we learned from that grant that the equipment, um, because it's old, it's, you know, 40, 50 or 60 years old, does not really want to work all the time very well. And so what we took from that pilot project, which I think digitized maybe a total of like 40 discs, um, was that we did not have the capacity because we didn't have the appropriate infrastructure and equipment yet. And that at, what we would continue to do is digitize on demand for patrons who needed access to these older recordings. And that's what we've done ever since. We tried another grant a few years ago and it, it wasn't accepted because of basically um, just the priority from the grant funders. And then we're working on another one this year. So I would just say, see if there's alternative software or find a partner that maybe you can share costs with. Yeah, don't underestimate the value of uh, those partnerships. <laughs> yeah, so this question here about the, uh, what is the cost for 100 books in a museum to make a proposal project? Um, there's a couple of different resources you can consult for that. Um, I would probably uh, maybe ask for a quote from some potential vendors, um, but there's also some calculation tools available from the Digital Library Federation They've tried to put together some calculators that actually take into account not only the digitization, but like the staff and the overhead, just so that you can calculate costs. Because in this case, I mean, it'll depend on how many pages are in the book, um, whether you have access through a vendor or through buying equipment to maybe a more dedicated book scanner that can handle the fact that it's like a bound volume that you can't just like smush flat on a flatbed. And so you, you might, you might want that more specialized equipment. So I would look that up because um, the DLF is kind of a grassroots organization. They do a conference, but they're also very tied in closely with the uh, clear council of library and information resources, which does provide grants. And they have a lot of resources for preparing for grants. And you can use that just to put together your proposal or costs for doing something in-house as well. Okay, and then um, we'll address this last question. And then I think that's about all we have time for today. But um, we have a question here that asks, is it common for the outsourced institution to gain full access to materials or collections that are digitized, or is this something that is more on a case-by-case -case basis? Um, in order for the outsourced institution to be able to digitize the collection, they will need access to it. So um, in the example that I presented um, about the Park City Museum, we, um, at, at the museum, uh, staff sort of, uh, you know, boxed everything up and drove it to the University of Utah's Marriott Library. And the, the collection was at the Marriott Library for several months while the library um, staff worked on digitizing. So that collection was not at the museum during that time. Um, so I sort of mentioned at the beginning of my um, presentation that that could be a con uh, to outsourcing um, work, especially if you're really, really nervous about that. But usually you can um, work, work, all, work out all the details in your contract um, you could possibly have um, temporary sort of transfer paperwork written up so that you have a rec record of that at your institution. Um, you can talk about what, what are the contingency plans, that kind of thing. Um, but keep in mind that these outsourced institutions are you know, professional. They know what they're doing. They handle collections all the time themselves. Um, so they're gonna, they're gonna take good care of your, of your, um, of your materials. All right, well, thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you for attending and for all your great questions. Yeah.